Good morning, everyone. Can I ask you to take your seats? And I'm, I'm sorry to ask you to stop your fantastic conversations, but we do need to get started. I'm Johanna Nesseth. I uh, actually currently work for Chevron, which is an energy company, but uh, I'm affiliated with CSIS. I started our food security program here about five or six years ago. So I've, I'm staying involved and am really delighted to have you all here this morning and hopefully throughout the day. I want to give you a brief background on how we got to this conference today and what we're trying to do with it. It actually grows out of a series of, um, of really excellent projects that have been supported by the Templeton Foundation. I see Chris Stosky is here from the Templeton Foundation. And about three years ago, this foundation, which takes on sort of big questions of ethics and humanity and science, um, asked the question and put out a sort of an RFP saying, you know, can biotechnology, can genetics promote food security for smallholder farmers? And they launched a series of 14 grants. Um, CSIS was very happy to be one of the grantees. We did a project looking at um, sort of the regulatory and public opinions around uh, biotechnology in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. Um, and we have here, you'll hear throughout the day, from a number of the other researchers. And the reason why I felt that this was so valuable is that we have now, we're, we're coming out with 14 new sets of original research around biotechnology. I think all of the grantees acknowledge that biotechnology is sort of just a pathway for all kinds of ag technology and new types of approaches for tech transfer and skills and research to happen in developing countries. Um, so what happened as, and I, for any gr uh, grantors or funders, I would highly recommend the process that the Templeton Foundation took. They had actually a head grant in, in Cambridge in the UK, and we've got Patrick here from, from that program. They assembled all of the grantees twice during the course of this project. The first time was about at the midpoint in the project and gave everyone a chance to present what the project basis was, what they were doing, where they were working. And then the second time, um, just this April, was a chance to really start reporting out on what we'd learned and sort of test and ask questions about our research outcomes. Um, and as the U.S. has embarked on this process around food security as a major development priority, having that new research come through, I think, can be really valuable. Because I have felt that in Washington, since uh, the Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa used to do a big conference every year um, talking about new ideas around food security. And that, that conference hasn't happened for a couple of years, but it seemed really appropriate to have a working level conference to talk about new ideas coming out of the field and putting, um, putting some new research out. So very fortunately, two, two of the grantees of um, the 14 were from the University of Missouri, which uh, focuses on a community of practice approach. And they were uh, awarded a grant from the Mizzou Foundation to hold a conference in Washington. So we were really lucky at CSIS that they chose to partner with us. I think five or six of the other um, project leaders are here. Um, I would note that I think 10 or 12 of the 14 are based at US land grant universities, which I think highlights the immense importance of the land grants in terms of um, not only our own US ag research agenda, but the long-term development agenda and the importance of blending together US research uh, institutions and uh, those in developing countries. So um, Ken and Willie and, and Jerry will say more about what Missouri is doing, but they've been um, wonderful, wonderful organizers, as you know. We've got a great program ahead of us today. And um, I want to just briefly now introduce Brady Deaton, who was the former chancellor of Missouri, and he now is the BIFAD chair. And uh, he is going to uh, sort of kick things off in terms of how we look at meaningful knowledge. I think we can all agree that there's a lot of technology there's a lot of opportunity for increasing productivity among smallholder farmers. The real question is how, how do people take up new technologies and new practices uh, and put them to work? So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I look forward to talking with you more. Joanna, thank you for the opening remarks. And thank you for hosting us here at CSIS. Welcome to everyone this morning to this conference, and uh, you're a wonderful looking group full of energy and vibrancy for the day. So 
I know that given the program that we have in front of you, uh, we're not going to let you down in that respect. I was asked to take just a moment this morning uh, as an introduction to the day's events to sort of set a context. And I was asked to define meaningful knowledge. I suspect this is a group of very high-powered researchers for the most part that have worked with uh, definitions and solid research methodology for some time. So I'm not going to bore you with details of that. But we appreciate so much this opportunity to really bring ground level research into the Washington discussion. Those of us at the University of Missouri are very, very excited to be part of the process. Certainly from my role with, as chair of BIFAD, uh, I see the relevance of this to what we've been trying to do uh, with the land grant universities with research based knowledge from the field into the policy making that is occurring. I think a theme of, uh, or an underlying premise of what we're talking about today is that too often we fail to understand some of the most critical on the ground features of the cultural and economic context of those participants and processes and the target clientele of policies that we have underway around the world. That's fundamental. That's what this research project that we're going to be reporting on today will reveal some of the insight into this. The focus on global, on the smallholders of the world globally, the role they play in addressing food security and poverty, I think it goes without saying to a group like this why this is so vital. It's a critical part, certainly, of this administration's foreign policy. It reflects a moral commitment of the United States for certainly in the post-World War II era at a minimum, and certainly it goes back earlier than that, but I think that's important that we not forget it. The political instability that we saw as a result of the very rapid food price increases in 2007 and 8 caught the world's attention when over 30 governments around the world fell due to the high prices of food, meaning the reduction in real wage that occurred to urban and rural people, those working in the urban markets as well. Well, we're in a world where not only is climate change occurring and challenging all that we do ecologically, the need for what USAID and others are calling intensive sustainability or sustainable intensification uh, in the agricultural development processes, uh, that is vital to what we are doing. We know that we need to understand a lot more about the populations that we're working with, particularly the household behavior, to be able to interpret how we can achieve responsiveness at the ground level by smallholders to the kinds of incentives and policies that we're undertaking. That behavior is fraught with various forces of decision making and the balance of power that occurs within households, within communities, with those who are really opinion leaders and with the various forces of agencies and markets that occur around the world. We know that the information communication technology shapes the way those households behave in the marketplace in collective participation in, the, in economic and social and cultural activities. And certainly it is at the, the basis of our commitment to try to deal with the human and institutional capacity development that can sustain these short run changes into long run trajectories that truly change the nature of economic development in the world today and lift up those in extreme poverty that roughly a billion people in the world today who still go to bed hungry uh, each night. We, for the first time in history, have seen progress in reducing those numbers, and we want to see that progress continue. So there are major forces at work that lend themselves to the results of science that you're engaged in, to efficiency and management, such as the reduction of post-harvest losses, which continue to plague us at 30 to 40 percent of the world's food supply. So everyone says, oh my goodness, can't we at least reduce that in half or more and, and get these immediate gains? Well, we can to some extent. But there's no question, as Johanna reflected in her remarks, that ultimately addressing the challenge of feeding 9 billion people by 2050 will require the very best of science and innovation and genetic modification and addressing all the realms of the socioeconomic and climatic changes that challenge us in this process. And we have so many examples, far more than I could go into here in a few minutes this morning, but I think it's very important that when we think about meaningful knowledge and incorporating it into the policy process that we recognize the need for the multidisciplinary approaches to addressing these issues. 
And one of the sponsors of this event here today is the Mizzou Advantage, which is a University of Missouri academic set of programs oriented toward multidisciplinary work that is problem solving in its end product. It encaptures basic science through the translational aspects into the field. And fortunately, we have a, a number of individuals here today that can reflect that. So one definition of meaningful knowledge that I borrowed from Corinne Valdivia, actually, or paraphrase some of her words that I'll share with you, is knowledge that is contextualized, salient or relevant, and from trusted sources, generated through participatory processes in order to build from local knowledge. There's various ways of restating that, of course, but basically that knowledge guides you into a full understanding of the social, economic, religious bases of community, its structures, and responsiveness in the way that household operates and the way that that community operates with the broader global society. We're in a period of globalization where we have the, all that heterogeneity around the world brought into a picture that we're trying to, from a social science perspective, uh, bring into an organized behavioral context that we understand. And certainly those of us in agricultural economics or economics generally know how many times we have failed to capture the essence of this behavior through the kind of aggregate models we use that leave us not understanding the distribution of income, uh, the distribution of capital formation, uh, the challenge to households for nutrition, and the dynamics that occur that change that and make it so important to the future generations that are the ultimate result of these processes. So we must focus intergenerationally on what we are doing, and we must take a longer-term view as we shape and craft these short-run strategies. They must lead to a longer-run perspective. In fact, we have seen Abuses of this, misleading information, guide major national policy in so many ways. Uh, the book, How Asia Works, by Joe Studwell, was introduced to me by Jeff Ehlers uh, in our last conversation. I had a good look at that. And it's very, very interesting in the criticisms that he brings forward, and I think they are fair criticisms, of the misconceptions of World Bank policy for a decade that misguided a lot of what the international agencies did. They led the US government into a channel that did not lead to, agri to, to productive agricultural enterprise. We had, even within USAID, as Julie and others know, Julie Howard, who's with us today, led the agencies away from an emphasis on agricultural development, when in fact, the actual fundamental model of economic change in question required those investments in the science of agriculture and the transformation of that sector to make the kind of long-term capital formation possible across the entire society. Studwell does a beautiful book of capturing some very complex economic theory that I spent the early part of my career addressing and put it in a context uh, that we all can understand. So it is a book I'll, I'll recommend, let me say, uh, to you as well. You know, I learned early in my own life that economic transformations and innovation require that meaningful knowledge. Let me just take a, a moment here. I grew up in a subsistence farming area of eastern Kentucky uh, where uh, every decision you made had to be crafted very carefully uh, to ensure that your family survived, particularly if you had nine children like we did in my family. And so the region, the state, and extension were very involved in trying to introduce new agricultural approaches that would help us all have more income. And so I got to watch how, with strawberries, for example, pushed appropriately by a marketing firm, private sector firm is very important, uh, the uh, extension service was there leading the way. But for a household like ours, we could not afford any risk of, mis of reallocating labor, of taking any chance on the couple of cash items we had in our budget to ensure that we survive day to day, nor from the very large amount of food production on our own farm. So our family never had the wherewithal. There was no guarantee on strawberries, an example I think that the work you're going to hear may depart from. I think any major transformation like this requires test plots and it requires some security system for the first year of innovation to ensure that you don't lose your shirt. 
the only families in my community that could take advantage of this were the larger farmers who had extra land. We had no extra land. Every inch was used for our milk cows or our hogs or our chickens or our food production or our tobacco, which was the only cash crop we had along with a little bit of livestock. So these were critical decisions and this is faced by smallholders around the world today. And that's the nature of the meaningful knowledge is tapping into that and saying, how are those decisions made? Which decisions did my mother make about which investments we undertook, how to allocate our labor versus the decisions my father made. Those were very separate. They're separate in every culture and they vary a great deal. And we have to come to terms with that. But it's clear that linkages into the commercial economy are critical. The empowerment of women and the understanding of their role in a household and a community is important. Supportive partnerships with extension, with private business, with knowledge transfer and technology that can really make a difference in the outcomes of any kind of program that we're shaping. And I've had the good fortune in my professional career to see programs like this in so many areas and to understand why they can be so vital. Uh, with work with banana producers in Grenada, with uh, millet and corn producers in Kenya, with, uh, with shrimp production in southern Thailand, with Mandarin production in northern Thailand, where I served as a Peace Corps volunteer, the Mandarins there, with rubber production and the question of can you integrate food crops into this, which uh, Corinne's very familiar with Nunesan's research in North Medan, supported by the small room at CRISP, let me say, uh, revealed all these studies throughout my career have revealed how very, very difficult the smallholder response can be and how meaningful knowledge has to be addressed to bring this out to policymakers so that a major World Bank project in North Medan has to account for the fact that smallholders dealing with rubber also have to produce food. Maybe they can't integrate it, therefore you set aside extra land somewhere and make it possible or else the program falls apart. I could talk far longer than the program permits on so many of these examples which I've studied, my graduate students have studied, and out of which become uh, the basis for some very, very meaningful knowledge in the processes that we're engaged in. So, and someone mentioned yesterday, we need a library of all this. We need to think of a big data system of, of capturing all this data and making it useful to decision makers today and to the next generation of graduate students that look at this. So we will be at work trying to achieve some of that as well. With that, let me simply move to our two feature speakers, keynoters that we have today. And I'm going to introduce the first of those, uh, Corinne Valdivia, Associate Professor of Agriculture and Applied Economics at the University of Missouri. I will then, after introducing Corinne, go to Jeff and his colleague uh, for the next part of the program. But Corinne is going to uh, deal with uh, this issue of meaningful knowledge as it relates to the study she has undertaken in many parts of the world. And she's had such an incredible uh, history herself in leading projects in Peru, Indonesia, Bolivia, Tanzania, Kenya, Mexico, Uganda, and India. Uh, Corinne, that's really phenomenal. And she is a native of, of Lima, Peru, and received her early education and served as an associate professor at the National Agricultural University in Lima. She fortunately came to the University of Missouri and received her, her PhD and since 1992 has focused on the issue of gender and has co-edited a book on gender and natural resources with Jerry Gillies, who's also in the audience here today. Her, foc her research focus has emphasized strategies of transforma transformation, pathways through transformative change that leads to economic and social improvement in the livelihood of households, communities, and individuals. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Corinne. She was on the search committee that brought me to the University of Missouri in 1989. Thank you, Corinne. And I've been very happy to work with her as a colleague over many years. We're very pleased to have you with us this morning. Welcome. So, my technology ready? Okay. This is going to be new. I'm used to walking around rather than standing behind a podium. And so I'm going to figure out, uh, there we go. Um, this one, and we're going into, no, that's not it. Oh. 
I think I need help. Oh, right here, right here, right here. I found it. Um, here, right there, down there. You need to put it in the first one. There you go. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So I'm, they, they actually put that monitor right there because I'm used to having stuff in front of me. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. I'm really excited about being here today because I think that this is an issue that we need to address together. And we have a lot of wonderful people coming from different walks of life that can work together. I'm figuring out how do we make uh, the meaningful knowledge that we are creating something that's part of the way we do things every day in development. And so I'm going to talk today about first white choice and voice, which is uh, actually um, something that's key to us when we're working with smallholder farmers. Um, then I'll go into lessons from science and translational research with smallholder farmers, what we've learned. And uh, finally, I'll talk uh, a little bit about the lessons learned from the work that was done with Templeton Foundation funding uh, in South Africa and in Kenya, and draw some lessons from that, that hopefully will give you some, um, a little bit of food to uh, chew on, I guess, uh, in order to, when you go into the sessions, really look at what you do and how do we really do a collaborative process of discussions to make our knowledge even better or more meaningful? Um, at least that's what I am looking forward to in our meeting today. And I don't know who's managing time. I tend to talk too much. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so let me go into why voice and choice. Oh, there we go. Why it matters. For me, it matters in, um, I guess, full disclosure, I grew up uh, professionally with the Small Ruminant Collaborative Research Support for Program. And I started as a faculty at, at the University uh, in Lima, approached by professors from the University of Missouri many years ago to see if we wanted to do research together in the highlands of South America. And it was an opportunity for us at the university to actually link what we were teaching and the work that we could do in the field and bring those together and also bring that reality of the context of the highlands to the classrooms. Um, and the other thing that's happened to me because of that is I've had the opportunity, all those places that Brady Deaton mentioned, were possible because of the small room and crisps and the collaborative work that was done through the University of Missouri with many, many countries and organizations in the world. So I've walked through many shoes and hopefully that can help me understand all my limitations. Uh, and, um, and so I'm really always um, looking forward to having discussions that augment what I know about the world. And this is a great opportunity for that. But we know that women and men make decisions every day in a context that's very vulnerable. For me, it matters because I grew up in the public realm, working to produce public goods that are relevant and have impact in society. So I'm always interested in figuring out how do we use our knowledge and our resources in order to improve the livelihoods of people, especially those that are normally um, isolated, marginalized, uh, which is a context that happens very much. And we learned that, especially in Latin America, where a lot of the participatory research started. Meaningful knowledge, as um, already um, Brady Deaton mentioned, ha has to do with having relevant, relevant uh, knowledge, relevant to the decision maker. Uh, in the language and context of the decision maker and coming from a trusted source. Um, we know that we need that type of knowledge and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we build it, but I also want to pose a question, is that sufficient? We talk about necessary and sufficient conditions in economics. 
And so we know that meaningful knowledge is necessary, but probably it's not sufficient for the knowledge to be actionable. And so let me bring you to Latin America for a little bit, because that's where uh, we started working on participatory research with communities. And that is a place where many communities, rural communities, actually live marginalized from the mainstream poli political context. So their voice is often not heard. Um, here, um, and I should acknowledge, um, in this case, NOAA, they have actually, if you don't know now, a climate and society project. At the time, it was a human dimensions project, trying to understand if uh, climate forecasting had an impact, how, how can we use climate forecasts or not? Uh, and we took that opportunity to say, hey, we've been working in the Andes and we know they're facing droughts, they're facing frosts. Can we, can we really put forward a proposal? And we were able to do that and got funding to work in the Andean regions of Peru <clears throat> and Bolivia, looking at how farmers were making decisions under uncertainty and if climate forecasts, new knowledge, could be useful to them. Rosita, here, this is through the Sam and Chris project. We work collaboratively with them um, in, from 2006 to 2010. So we were able to come back to, um, to these communities. But before that, I met Rosita when she was the one that welcomed us to her community when she was only 18 to talk about the key uh, local knowledge that they have, the indicators like the Pleiades, they look at the stars and the conditions, how well they can see them. They look at other physical indicators or biophysical indicators like the bushy uh, shrub, the tola, and how often and when it, it flowers. So these are, this is knowledge that has been generated for centuries and has been useful to farmers in figuring out what to do when, some, when they're going to plant, when to plant, what to plant. Uh, so these, these, uh, this is really, really key knowledge that even has been validated by science. Um, these are very important indicators for the key security, food security crop from the Andean region, which is potatoes. And potatoes are um, originated from Peru and Bolivia and the Andean region, but now we eat them everywhere and even the, the beautiful varieties of potatoes that you can see in the Andes, you're starting to see, for example, here in our markets in the US. Okay, so why Rosita is important to me? Because she's a leader in her community. She started at 18, and currently she leads a women group. She was the officer of, of her community, and if you don't know, uh, communities in Peru are peasant communities that have a social structure and organization and are officially recognized by the government. So she has a say in what can happen. And so working together with Rosita, I've, I've learned about their knowledge, but I also, with working with a lot of scientists that I happen to be sitting here today, we've been working to understand the changes that these communities are going through because of climate change, because of global drivers. And from the research that we were able to do with the Samran CRISP uh, during the period that we were working in the Andes, uh, we actually found out that in the past 50 years, the temperature has increased in this area. So when we started, people were saying, well, there is no proof. Well, science is now showing that there is a proof. Uh, obviously, farmers knew that the temperatures were increasing because they're actually changing the patterns of plants that they can grow at different elevations. But we needed to prove it to the scientific community. But it has a value because when you do that, policymakers listen to you and invite you to talk. Um, and therefore, you can actually be an agent of change bringing the issues that are happening at the local level. So that's one one dimension. The other thing that we found out is that besides that, the climate change projections for this particular region are showing that there will be uh, more drier springs when you're planting and more wetter summers. So this is going to be a contrast from what they're currently doing. And you can see those changes starting to happen with the delayed rains and then extreme events happening. Um, the other thing is 40 degrees Celsius temperature rise by the end of the century, which is pretty, if you think that this is the mean, this is the mean, can you think about the extremes in that context? 
We also have found uh, through the projections that there will be more soil moisture loss in this context, um, uh, which is, is interesting because the rainy season is going to be wetter, but the soils won't be able to capture that humidity. So um, there are a lot of challenges that are happening here. And what I'm trying to highlight here is mostly the fact that we are going through a lot of changes, rapid changes in areas. And the mountain regions are the best place probably to see those changes, those dramatic changes, both in climate and the consequences to the landscapes and the environment and the dynamics of pests that we, we, we think about as uh, they create a lot of losses. So there, these transformational changes that communities have to negotiate are many. Climate is one global markets and their indicators and incentives, um, the environmental stressors. Uh, in, in the case of um, the communities where we were working, the nature of the Andean weevil was changing and the behavior was different, but the farmers weren't aware of that. So through collaborative research, we were discovering that together. And that's the royal we because I'm not an entomologist. Um, but there are others like government policies that can be a benefit to communities or can be a challenge to communities. And what we're finding is when we look at landscapes in a specific context, we find contrasts where in some places, communities are benefiting from the policies of governments like decentralization, for example, because now they know what they need for adaptation. And so they're using those, those resources to invest in that. While in other cases, the policies, such as price policies in, in other communities, are such that producers can gain enough to stay in that community. So you have a lot of out-migration going on, which increases the responsibility of women that are staying behind to keep their, um, their identity, which is to be sheep, her uh, sheep and alpaca herders. They call themselves alpaqueras or pastoras. Um, so that's why it matters, and there are many changes going on. Science, as Brady pointed out, can contribute a lot uh, to figuring out what we need to do. But at the same time, we need to make sure that this is in the context of the decision makers. So how science has inf informed what we call translational research with smallholder farmers. Scientists and farmers' knowledge have two different systems, right? We tend to make assumptions, reduce, do our models, uh, do away with many of the, the, the context realities, and come up with solutions. Farmers build their knowledge from experience, from the day-to-day, -day, figuring out what to plant and when to plant. So there is, a, there is a disconnect between the ways that scientists think and the way that farmers think. So when we're thinking about creating new knowledge, we're thinking really about how, how do we go about the process of linking the knowledge systems of farmers and scientists uh, to work in these particular transformational contexts. What we've found is that when there is a conflict between, and that came out very clearly in the forecast uh, research, when, when you see that um, the forecasts are saying one thing, but the indicators like Rosita's indicators are saying something different, the farmer will trust their own knowledge because it's the knowledge that they're more familiar with on the one hand, and the other one that was also mentioned by Brady that's very important, they can't take risks. They're food insecure. They're maybe making ends meet, or maybe they're already stinting on food. So the chances of taking risk with something new that doesn't come out from their experience is very low. So that makes a case for the need for working together and trying to develop techniques and processes that allow for farmers to take those risks, uh, calculated risks. And I'm going uh, to just show you very briefly what we find, for example, in, in the northern altiplano of, of uh, Bolivia. You have farmers with an average of $2 a day income, so pretty vulnerable, with um, only five years of education, so that means elementary education in average, <clears throat> and very uh, small amount of land. At the same time, they're farming in a context where the communities, the families in a, in, in a community, in a peasant community, actually tend to lose 80% of their crops to pests, uh, or sorry, 80% of the families tend to lose crops to pests. 
uh, and 50% experienced losses due to frost, and 50% experienced losses of animals. Animals are what in these contexts? They are asset base. That's where we save because banks don't work in many of these places. Um, and uh, this is a, a high degree of loss for communities that are already vulnerable. So given the fact that they are in this, in this context, what we, what we find is that their perceptions of risk are very high in terms of how is this a very strong threat to your context. So we asked about climate, we asked about policies, we asked uh, about that, that disease uh, of an adult member of the family and how are those threats to the family. And all of those tend to be consistently high. Again, we're talking about high perceptions of risk and dread, which means your, your context, the science is showing that in a, in a high level of uh, concern and dread, the likelihood of taking new knowledge is going to be low. I keep on pointing that because we, as scientists, always come up with solutions thinking, oh, I'm an expert on this, so I can deal with drought. Or, ooh, I'm an expert with this other area of uh, plant pathology, and I can deal with this. But at the same time, what, what I'm saying is that in the way we frame our work, we need to frame it from the context of those decision makers, and not necessarily from our offices at the university. So, um, so how do we engage in meaningful knowledge? There's Rosita again. Um, so one of the things that is important, therefore, is to focus on two-way communication processes. So when we talk about participatory research, we're talking about really two-way communications. Sometimes participatory research is more extractive, right? So you go there, get information from, from the farmers, take it over, and, and you do your work. No, the idea is two-way participation so we are learning from each other. Because that enhances trust. And trust is key in order for somebody to take chances on your knowledge. And then participatory uh, workshops can therefore be effective in communicating this. And uh, Pat uh, et al. in Zimbabwe, also looking at forecasts and the use of this new knowledge, found that yes, participatory research really is contributing to the more trust in the use of knowledge. But we also have a problem uh, when we are thinking just of the climate forecast example. The problem is that we have actually um, very many difficulties in forecasting climate in very specific contexts. And so there is no enough information for climate forecasts for mountain regions because of the fact that there is a lot of regional variability in the effect of the, the mountains. So therefore, what we've been working on, um, the Royal We, um, is um, working with farmers, learning about their biophysical in indicators, and linking the farmers with Semnami, the scientists at Semnami that are uh, developing the forecast for the region. So there is a connection, a network being built to share the knowledge that's happening on the ground in local communities. Um, another lesson for us is that we need to work in teams, teams that are really diverse in terms of knowledge and cultures. And we need to learn to work in teams and to respect the knowledge of everybody. Uh, in this particular case, I'm showing a picture where you have uh, professors of the University of Missouri. You have uh, Neil Flora in the corner, for example, that was working with us in, in this um, research. And she's sitting right there in the back. Um, but the idea is we have officers from Tsunami of Bolivia, officers from Tsunami the weather forecasting system, public, and Peru. We have uh, people that are teachers at universities, local universities. We have the farmers that are welcoming us to their communities and working with us. So it's a very diverse set of groups that requires actually very way, formal ways of working with them. And in this particular case, in addressing the risks of vulnerable farmers, we work to design with the community ways of working that can account for that risk. Many of the participatory research that was done, for example, on soils was on fields of women that were widowed. 
because the community decided that, that would, we could generate an income for the, for the widow at the same time that we were experimenting together in farmer fields. Um, just one example. In the particular case of the context of, of um, Missouri, and uh, not Missouri, of, of Bolivia, soils are a key resource, and we saw that we're going to be losing soil moisture by the end of the century. So a lot of the research focused on gathering knowledge about the, the soils, experimenting with the farmers and in their context and with their designs and with our soil scientist, Peter Moravalli, and the soil scientist in Bolivia to figure out what, um, what types of techniques were useful and also connect students from the universities in Bolivia, from the rural community, and the professors. So what you're doing here is building human capital in building a different way of working together. So translational research process and the new community of practice. I wanna talk about the two cases that we worked on because of the Templeton Foundation uh, funding uh, that provided this opportunity. And it was exciting for us because we were able to work for Missouri in two different contexts. A context where GM technologies have not yet been approved uh, but there is a research going on in them focused on cassava. In a context where GM technology, maize, is used a lot in production by commercial farmers in South Africa. So two cases, South Africa and Kenya. Um, and in this particular case, uh, the, the South Africa team, uh, it's Mayers, Gillis, Hendrickson, Dandala, Schneeberger, and Folk, we're working with farmer groups, uh, developing a community of practice. And the idea of community of practice is a place where everybody is equal, where the knowledge of everybody is valued at the same time. And so it was a process for farmers that had never farmed, in many cases, to learn how to farm hybrid varieties, maize, and how to also farm GM varieties. Uh, but especially, it was an opportunity for them to be involved in the whole process, learning together with um, the people in South Africa that were collaborating together. And so it allowed uh, farmers to try technologies by themselves uh, on their own uh, after having training on, on doing uh, the farming practices. And, um, and the other thing is it made stakeholders more aware of the constraints and what farmers are looking for. So in many cases, GM and uh, hybrid varieties uh, or seeds were okay, but they had labor constraints, for example. Um, they're, they're, the, the whole process was a very positive uh, process in terms of working together, but it was interesting that many of the issues that were brought up were more related, again, to markets and to storage. So we go back to, yes, we have the innovation, we have the technology, but there is a, a whole set of context issues that are important. These farmers want to be commercial farmers. They want to have high yields, and they want to be integrated into the markets as the commercial farmers that were the dominant there before them. In, our, in the case of, of um, Kenya, we had um, a process in... Uh, Harvey James, uh, Bill Folk, Festus Morithi from Kari, and myself collaborated on this project. And the idea was to learn from the communities, their local knowledge, what was their context, and based on that, figure out um, what are the communication processes that need to be in place in order for uh, farmers to learn about GM technologies. So if they're going to learn a new technology, we again need to go through the process of understanding their context so that we can create the meaningful knowledge that, has, um, they, that is understand, understood by the farmers in their own context, but at the same time learn about what their issues are. Um, so we started first with a lot of training, capacity building on the process of translational research. How do we work with farmers? Why are we understanding the vulnerability context? Why do we need to learn about their livelihood strategies and farming practices and, and so on? And, uh, and then we went to the field um, 
in working with uh, rural communities, mostly women, the highest proportion of the people that participated in a project were women. We were hoping for 50-50, but actually there were more women than men in our projects. We worked in collaboration with other stakeholders. CARI has in Mtuapa Research Center uh, technologies on the processing of cassava for food and for being able to sell that. So it's not only about consuming the cassava, but also being able to process it and gain uh, from the market. Uh, and uh, with uh, different types of settings from the coast that was very vulnerable, where food security is very important, to new settings like um, Eastern Province, where there, is com there are commercial villages being funded by donors to try to commercialize production. And, and therefore, going through this process, creating a conversation among, again, multiple types of decision makers, including the farmers that are in that last picture. We found from them that, again, as in Latin America, and this is something that we all know, that the context is very difficult, that there is a lot of risks, there are a lot of repeated shocks going on in the communities, and the feeling of dread is pretty high. And uh, these are just from the coast, from a re, uh, women group recalling the, the shocks that they've experienced in the past and what were the impacts of those shocks. Um, and so our, our translational research process starts by understanding that vulnerability context and insecurity with the farmers through participatory processes where farmers come in uh, to their own communities, They're, they decide where they want to do the meetings, and, um, and then we have techniques to gather information from women and, and men separately and identify vulnerable groups and less vulnerable groups to see if the messages are similar or not. Um, we uh, understand what the role of cassava plays for them in, li in their livelihood strategies. It's a food security crop, definitely, and the coast. Well, there are some uh, um, better off farmers, women farmers, they're actually trying cassava for ethanol production. So there is, there is a whole uh, diversity of context. We learn from the farmers about their preferences and their context. The next step is we talk with the scientists. And the scientists, uh, by talking to the scientists, I, don't, I, I mean actually the scientists that are experts in Kenya on cassava production, to figure out what their take is on what farmers need and what um, this is showing um, to contrast and to get the feedback. And then the scientists with other stakeholders responding to the needs of what the farmers prefer, which was more marketing, more storage, more learning about processing, come back to workshops to learn about those at the same time that they're learning about genetic modification and what it means. And finally, we bring all the uh, stakeholders together to have conversations. So farmers are re elect representatives that come and be part of the table. And I'm going to go through this very fast. This is just the whole process. But the, I think on the one hand is creating the minimal, meaningful knowledge, the context. Um, the context, what does this knowledge mean to the farmer given their context? Do we want um, pest-resistant cassava that may not have the starch that the farmers need? Or do farmers want that? They want starch. They may not want as many yield, high yields because they, don't, they can't store it. And some farmers say, you know, cassava is good for us for food security, but we worry also about eating too much cassava because it's a starchy food. And so that brings back to the scientist the reflection of really how do we build knowledge with our science that is relevant to that decision maker. Um, and so it's an opportunity to learn, but at the same time to build capacities, to build human capital, to build the social networks, and to build the political capital to be able to have the voice and choice of the farmers present at the table. Um, but there are, uh, and so these processes have uh, facilitated mutual learning and also have built trust. But I, I think one of the things that I also want to point out is that there are always ca caveats that I, I'm hoping that we will also discuss, that we need to figure out how not to make simplifying assumptions, that that's something that we all uh, 
tend to do because of the way we, we, we work. Uh, the context matters, that for in some contexts, the political economy uh, actually maintains uh, groups separate from the mainstream, like the work that Carlos Ripalda and Astier have done in, in Mexico with GM discussions on MACE. It's a contrast to what's going on in South Africa, where GM is a, a technology that's not only um, accepted by the mainstream, but also by the, this black farmers that want to be commercial in a context where the government wants them to become commercial farmers. Uh, and then there are many forms of participatory research, and we need to also remember that because saying we do participatory research may mean that we are there to extract knowledge rather than to build knowledge together. Um, and so creating meaningful knowledge for us means to, uh, it's important because of this context of uncertainty, it, will, it takes more effort than starting from, from uh, what we know. Um, but it's important when we talk about that new community of practice. What the project in South Africa did, what the project in, in uh, Kenya did, was to not only do a project and figuring out how it works, it's really to building together the knowledge, uh, coming, having people come together and, and learn from scratch, bringing their skills, bringing their human capital, and figuring out how to link knowledge systems, but also to figure out what are the strategies for that knowledge to actually become useful in the decision-making process. And I like mountains, so this is the, another one. This is Kilimanjaro, and I was speaking with farmers that I also talking about the glacier, the glaciers no longer coming back as they used to. So those changes are happening and are happening fast. And I think I ran out of time because I wanted to show you a very short clip that if we have time, I'll show you uh, about the whole process with the women farmers. And they really sing very well. I can't do that. Thank you. Karen, thank you very much. We're off to a great start. Our next keynote speaker this morning is uh, Dr. Jeff Ehlers, who's program officer at the Gates Foundation. Uh, Dr. Ehlers has had a very distinguished career as a research scientist focused on genetic improvements of cowpea, a native African grain legume that's consumed in over 45 countries. He's authored many publications dealing with uh, various aspects of this, including the observation that Women farmers change the market to some degree by uh, seeing the value of green leaves and fresh-shelled peas, and that tilted it toward a more important component of the market, at least in one country where he studied, than, uh, than the dry grain. So uh, I, was caught, I was caught by that, Jeff. Thanks so much. Uh, Jeff has a tremendous background in the CRISP world, or what we now call innovation lab world of, of uh, cowpea production, and he's focused on how that offsets, how cowpeas can offset hunger periods in Senegal and Burkina Faso. And uh, he's also looked at genetic modifications of cowpeas for drought and heat uh, tolerance and many other disease-resistant uh, varieties. Uh, I was fortunate to be in Athens uh, attending the workshop of uh, the Innovation Lab when he received the TMAC Award of Merit this past spring. Uh, in their annual meeting, and it was the Technical Management Advisory Committee, TMAC, uh, award that he received. Jeff, we are very pleased you're here with us today, and we welcome you to talk on the subject of meaningful knowledge from smallholders and for smallholders, a Gates Foundation perspective. Welcome. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and uh, thank you, Brady, for the uh, generous introduction. Uh, I do want to say I think I'm following some big shoes after uh, Coriand, though, and I don't, do not have the development kind of background that, that she has. And to, to partly fulfill, uh, fill in some of my shortcomings uh, in that area, I brought along uh, one of my distinguished colleagues, Dr. Regina Kapinga. And uh, I thought the best strategy when I was asked to talk on this subject was to actually uh, bring Regina in as the voice of, a, of an African woman who spent uh, 16 years with the Tanzanian National Program, 
uh, eight years with the uh, Potato Center, the SIP uh, Potato Center, but based in, in Africa. And then uh, the last six years uh, as a senior program officer at the B uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So uh, I thought she would actually be able to share some, some stories even better than I could as more of a, a geneticist and breeder. So I thought I would actually begin with just some high-level comments and then turn it over to uh, Regina. Let's see if I can operate this right. I might need some help here to change the talk. How am I advancing it? Uh, you just click. That one. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry for that uh, little delay. So uh, in, my, in my own career, as Brady mentioned, I, I was more of an academic. I was at the University of California at Riverside working with uh, national program partners in, uh, in mostly in West Africa and mostly focused on legume systems. And we were always faced with what do we do with our, um, our results. And so I'll, I'll talk a, a little about that, but, uh, and then also about one of the projects I managed before turning over to uh, Regina. But I do want to uh, begin with sort of a brief overview. And a little bit, this is going to overlap with some of Brady's uh, comments. But OK, this is not working. Doesn't seem to. Sorry about that. I don't know why. Okay. Uh, which yeah. one did you click? I'm going right to test here. it. I'm sorry. Okay, cool. good. Okay, so I, I think the uh, the central hypothesis of of our workshop is that ag research is critical to to long term real economic growth. And as Brady mentioned, uh, this is, this is uh, eloquently laid out by, by Joe Studwell in his book, uh, How Asia Works. And this is a book that many of us have actually formed a book club around at the foundation, and we're, we're sort of reading it and, and studying it. And, it. and it's helping us clarify uh, some of the issues as we uh, particularly look to uh, African development and see if there's some parallels. Although, of course, today's uh, economy is much different than the period that, uh, say, countries like South Korea went through over the last 60 years. So I think, you know, for this workshop, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, smallholders being actively engaged in the research process, uh, which then will involve, uh, which, which will then result in improved targeting of needs uh, uh, and, and more ownership and buy-in, and then therefore a higher probability of, of adoption. But it's a, a tough business, and I think this is one thing that, um, you know, has struck me over the years is how hard it is to get adoption. And I think part of that is the risk aversion that Corianne talked about, uh, but also just that African farmers in their smallholder context being far from sources of, of uh, low-cost inputs, lacking government support systems around uh, finance for uh, production, um, uh, price supports, for example. And all of these kind of things are very important to have in an agricultural system. Uh, you know, most of the farmers in other parts of the world actually are quite, uh, quite subsidized in various ways, but not the small African farmer. So he's working in an environment that's unsubsidized, and he's operating at, at a low scale, operating in, in unpredictable uh, weather environments and even unpredictable policy environments as well. So I think all of these things uh, you know, make it much harder to, to adopt technologies that will inc uh, increase productivity. And just to point out that you know, the future really doesn't look much better in terms of prices that African farmers will get for what they produce. Uh, this is a uh, out of a report from the World Bank, which looks ahead at commodity prices uh, from 2013 out to 2025. And um, I don't know if you can if you can read all those numbers, but for many of the commodities that African farmers produce, there's really no prospect, according to this forecast at least, that prices will really increase. And I don't quite understand that, given all the talk about the need for food production and how dire the food uh, production will be trying to feed population when, in fact, prices are, are of many commodities are actually projected to, uh, to decline or not increase. So I, I'm not sure how, how that matches up, but I thought it was interesting to point out that we're not necessarily in a, 
in an increasing price scenario for us, our smallholder farmers. Um, I, don't know, you can, I don't know if, if you, I'll just point out for soybeans, for example, that are about $550 a ton today. In 2025, the World Bank's project, projecting them to be about $510, so actually a decline in prices. So, you know, whether this scenario will actually occur, we don't know, but uh, it's not encouraging. Um, and I think, you know, many of us realize that productivity gaps can be closed. There's often technologies that, uh, you know, particularly application of uh, fertilizers and inputs that actually can, uh, and improve varieties, uh, which I've been involved with, which can, which are really quite basic in, in their nature to get the big, big bump in productivity often requires small amounts of fertilizer, uh, improved seed, and uh, one or two key agrochemicals, you can get uh, large increases in yield. And, and these are the kind of, these kind of yield increases are the, the, the what stimulates uh, rural development and eventually uh, the path to economic uh, development. Um, and I think uh, um, Corianne and, and Brady have both talked about the difficulty of adopting, adopting in a risky uh, situation where you don't want to put your, your capital or your eggs uh, in one basket. And uh, uh, then the other, the other reason, of course, for lack of adoption, which uh, Regina will, I think, address quite nicely in a very good example that she's been involved with personally, is the idea of, of the poor research targeting. And I think that's a lot of what uh, many of you are involved with. Um, so uh, farmer participation in, in development execution phases of, of ag R&D really is, is quite rare, especially with the bigger development projects. I know many of you, of course, are involved in that. There are a few uh, European initiatives that I, that I came across on the internet, uh, which reflects my lack of uh, knowledge of the area. Um, but more commonly, a lot of what we fund uh, involves farmer participation more after the fact or after the design phase is, is done. And I think this, this is a key shortcoming uh, which, which we need to do a better job at, uh, frankly. Um, and of course, they, they don't necessarily address farmer concerns. We do try to involve farmers often after the, after the design phase uh, in terms of things like farmer preferred uh, varietal selection and other, other, other me methods, but they don't really become part of the DNA of the project early on. Uh, some of the projects, uh, I'll share a brief example, uh, do have some feedback loops with farmers and farmer involvement, but they don't necessarily address the critical uh, objectives and the prioritization as, w as well as they uh, could have in many cases. Um, so, um, so the project that I'll, I'll be uh, talking uh, about uh, just very, very briefly before I turn it over to Regina is our N2 Africa project and how they use uh, feedback loops to uh, improve the research or, or to uh, uh, fine tune the research. Uh, this is a pretty big project run out of uh, Wageningen that many of you uh, may be aware of. Um, and the basic idea is that you can increase productivity through, uh, through legumes and in, in, uh, particularly uh, by targeting improved inoculation, getting farmers to inoculate with rhizobia bacteria, and also then pea fertilizers, uh, improved seed and, and better agronomy. And in, in the new phase, they're also talking about creating demand through market linkages so that there's a, um, a demand pull in the, in the system. And so uh, they, in, the, in this project, uh, they have what they call uh, uh, feedback loops. So you've got a research component, a learning component that learns from farmers, and then a, uh, a delivery unit that takes what's learned from the M&E and redigest it back through the research and back to the farmers. So what they, what they actually do is in, in, the, in the many countries that they work in in, in Africa, they, they conduct uh, thousands of farmer-managed trials, and they, they're very simple trials, usually with just four treatments, a, a sort of a, a farmer control, uh, added phosphorus, added inoculum, and then added both phosphorus and inoculum. And by doing this at, at many, in many thousands of locations, uh, they can actually, and, and uh, having the farmer manage, and the farmer keeps very careful notes of, of what practices he's done throughout the trial, they can get quite a lot of good uh, feedback about what's actually happening with, with, their, uh, uh, with their technology package. And one of, the, one of the things they found was that a certain fraction of the environments don't respond to the phosphorus and inoculum. 
Uh, and what you see is in the bottom half, under the, in the low yielding environments, we're not getting a response to P and N inoculum. And so the question is, but we're getting very good response in maybe 50% or more of the environment. So what's going on in the, in the non-responsive environment? So we have to go back then and, and, uh, and, and look more carefully with the farmers and find out what's going on. And so th this is a, a slide showing uh, a farmer in his field, one of these fields that was not responding to, to the phosphorus and inoculum, but there was one plant in the middle of the field there, and, and they, they surmised that this is where a cow had walked by and uh, left a, a present for the soil, and in fact uh, uh, did, did its fertilization work. And, uh, but they were able to actually use that observation to, um, to then figure there must be something they can do to the soil. And so by doing a series of experiments, uh, uh, they could, uh, some missing nutrient experiments, they could figure out um, uh, what that missing nutrient was and then fine tune uh, back in, through the research process that it was actually a magnesium deficiency that they needed to address in the fertilizer blend. Um, so uh, that, that was just one example where they've used feedback loops. They've involved a lot of farmers. The farmers are engaged in taking notes um, and providing that feedback through an M&E system and then um, uh, readjusting the, the research program and the delivery package to meet the needs of the farmers. Um, I think looking ahead, uh, I think a lot of what Corianne presented is probably really the heart of it, and, and I tended to look at the tool or the methodology, uh, not the methodology, but more the, the tool aspect, uh, maybe a, a bias from my uh, narrower background. But, uh, you know, I, I see looking ahead that ICT will be a critical uh, a part of some of the tools that we can develop to help us uh, with the two-way communication with farmers, and, and we have some initiatives around that, um, both to extend information and also to receive information. So I think I, I don't want to spend uh, any more time. I want to uh, uh, turn it over to Regina to uh, take us to a, a real-world example, and um, uh, I think uh, uh, you'll hear a nice story from Regina, so thank you. You might need some Can I get help. someone to help me, please? Thank you very much. Uh, again, I will talk from the research side because I'm a researcher. But, uh, yeah. And, and I will just talk about the orange freshly sweet potato, which here is known as yams. So the, for vitamin A deficiency and the, to get it into the, the diets of of African farmers. Oh, no, oh. Okay. Yeah, so the, we, we wanted to know how the feedback loop uh, can be enhanced if, uh, to ensure that at least this uh, get into the, oh my God. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the, what I have, what, I must say that this is not from Gates' perspective, but it is collection of, of, I, yeah. Yeah, it is, a, it is collection of, of, of experiences from different studies which have been undertaken in the, in the region, in sub-Saharan Africa, more than 13 countries. And uh, it is all about uh, sweet potato. We know that sweet potato for, for, for sub-Saharan Africa is the crop which is eaten, but the uh, uh, farmers or the consumers were not used to orange fresh the sweet potato. Uh, and so to get that new trait in the, in the, in the farming communities, it needed some, some, more, uh, some, more, some more effort. And the goal actually is uh, that uh, at least 50% uh, of vitamin A in the, in, in the food diets, more especially for children and, uh, and mothers, uh, come from orange fresh sweet potato. So already the, the evidence was there, but the problem was how will this be accepted by, by farmers? And so 
the first the breeders introduced a lot of germplasm to the region, but unfortunately, many of these did not fit uh, the consumer or culinary characteristics which are, are, are required, are desired by the by the consumers, more especially the women who are caretakers. So, uh, from the, from the field. Uh, this is what the women as well as men, those who are involved in, in, in growing sweet potato, this is what they, they wanted to see in that very sweet potato, which is orange. At least the, at field level, there should be enough foliage uh, to smoothen the weeds. So it is all about the agronomic practices, but also resistance to pests and diseases, root yield, attractive root, the, the root shape and flesh, and for at consumer level, good appearance, taste, starchiness, and low fibrousness. Nobody mentioned about nutrition apart from the awareness, meaning that uh, you can't go into the field with just the nutrition message and anything is adopted. You still have to put into consideration many other uh, uh, characteristics. So the participatory work which I will not say much because uh, the first speaker really mentioned a lot about it, a two-way communication is how best to, to get uh, these varieties selected in, and uh, what could be the, the mechanism. Yeah, definitely uh, we, at the beginning it is all about uh, you spend, the breeder spends, the at least for sweet potato spends about eight years, uh, gets the good varieties which are high yield and whatever, getting them to the field and uh, not much is accepted. So the, the whole idea now was, okay, participatory variety selection, but at what stage? So instead of waiting until you're about to release uh, now the breeders take into consideration and involve the farmers basically more even at the population development. Uh, not necessarily to breed, but at least when they have a large number of varieties, they can get the, fam the, the farmers uh, to, in, in those localities to know what is accepted and some of them are removed. And that one has helped a lot, but of course, uh, this is backed up with the field days and the exchange visits by farmers to know what other farmers are doing. So, but at the same time, we noted also that uh, not every farmer can write. It, it, of course, there are uh, protocols where the farmers can, uh, can put in their, in, uh, their selection criteria and everything, but uh, not every farmer can write. So in that, uh, in that, in, in, in that circumstances, uh, the, the, some of the, of, of, the, of the innovations such as using just the cards, uh, one is green, one is yellow, one is red. Uh, the, the, the green card says uh, that this one is better than what we have. The yellow says this is comparable uh, to what we have. And red card, no, this is not the best, the, the, the best for us. And these red cards and these colors uh, should be very well known. And for us in Africa, many people really uh, watch soccer, and these are the same cards which are used. So when it is green, it is green. When it is yellow, it is yellow. When you are given red card, yellow, yes, it is really bad. So that one also helped a lot to, to, to get the farmers to, to enjoy the exercise of even uh, putting their ballots in, their, in, in, those, uh, in those bags. And it is from there then the researcher is able to collect and, uh, and, uh, and count those, the number of cards. But of course, remember, farmers, uh, men and women have different views, but to, for, to capture their views, their, 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 their views is better to know, yeah, even if it is green, is it by men or by women? And that one also contributed a lot because in some instances, actually men don't take much, they are not too particular, not too detailed, but remember at the end of the day, it is the woman who is going to prepare the meal. So if it is not accepted by them, it will not go. So that one also was part of, of the exercise. So again, remember in Africa, yes, you have, most of you have worked in Africa. You know when you have a group meeting, who will talk mo most, 
who will talk the, the best, who will talk, and if there is a, a man and a husband, uh, if a husband uh, says something, there is no way the woman will raise her hand to say no. Because that one has the implication again back to the household when the person goes back. So to capture the information which is very independent by using even these ballots like this, the, the woman has her freedom to say this is what I like and this is what I don't. And that one has helped a lot to, 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 get, to capture the voices of those who can't speak, more especially the women, depending on the cultures, in the majority of our African cultures, basically women, if they are together with the men, you will not find a lot of women talking much, more especially contrary to what the women, men has already, have already said. So with this, with this the, the innovative technique, it has been able to help us to, the, at least to, to capture the, the, the inform, at least the voices of women. And again, uh, it is not just uh, in the field, but also the researchers and the farmers to interact both in the field because there are things which we get in the meetings, but when you are in the field, there is a lot of details which they will be able to, uh, to, to, to give you. And so this one also has helped to, to bring in a lot of feedback. And here now, it is two way because there you are discussing in the field. And I must say that, yes, most of yeah, we, we can't generalize that all of the SSA will have everything uh, prioritized or whatever. In, it also goes by sub-regions. In some sub-regions, some things may matter and some not. For, for sweet potato, in West Africa, yes, they say we are ready for sweet potato, but it has to be blunt, like yam. Whereas in, sweet pot in East Africa, it is all different. So that one also has to be. Yeah. So these uh, interactions uh, between farmers, between researchers, has helped a lot. Uh, and again, for sweet potato, again, since this was being promoted for children, uh, children also have a role to play in selecting this. But remember, these are not the, the children who are targeted by the nutrition group. It is the nutrition group target, target those from zero, the mother is still is pregnant up to two years. But uh, these children, if you know in Africa, majority of these, you know, they are the ones who are caretakers of their siblings. So if they select anything, they are likely to influence even the young children. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, the acceptability of different uh, varieties is quite important, and so consumer studies has been part of this. And, uh, with that, what has this fed to the, to the breeding cycle now is that at least the, the platforms have been established in sub-Saharan Africa to capture, um, to capture, at least to do the adaptive testing in their localities. And all these, actually, we have noted that uh, Majority of these, uh, the, with the sweet potato, if it is orange, linking with the nutrition group is quite important because there are things which will not be captured by the agricultural researchers alone. Again, spreading the word has to go out when this is, uh, is done and uh, different um, mechanisms using schools, using promotion shows and uh, uh, agricultural shows have also helped us in scaling up the, the orange fresh sweet potato. And what is happening now, we are seeing now, at least in many fields now, uh, there is some gradual inclusion of orange colored varieties in the diets as well as in the fields, which didn't happen in the past. So I will not go into this, but at least these are the key learnings whereby we have noted that for sweet potatoes, since this is still a crop which is managed by women, the role played by women is quite high. Children also should be an integral part of this exercise. Income generation is important because we can see, although it was considered like a subsistence, but now at least every household has some to, 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 to grow and some to sell. So I want to thank you very much and uh,
we be able to, to answer many of the questions. Time was not enough to, to put everything on the board. Thank you.